Welcome to the future, you guys. We endeavor to bring you really smart people, and today, on today's episode, we're going to be talking to such a person, Professor Scott Davis is going to be on the show, and he's going to be talking about marketing and the science of exchange. So put your thinking caps on, get your notebooks out, because we're going to do a deep dive on this. And I'm always thrilled to talk to people much smarter than me, so this is one of those occasions where I get to relish that somebody as an expert gets to share their knowledge with us, and I want to tell you a couple things about our guest today. He's got a PhD, PhD in marketing. Yeah, he went to the Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. He got his BBA at the University of Delaware in Newark. He's an assistant professor of marketing as of 2017. He's also a postdoctoral fellow, and he's been published. Super cool. Some things that he's been published on are articles on building your personal brand from the inside out, don't sweat the big stuff, and in the Harvard Business Review, when the customer is stressed. We're gonna keep it real, we're gonna keep it raw. Erica, please do me the honor of rolling the titles. Yay! All right, we're gonna welcome Professor Scott Davis to the show. <laughs> hey, thank you. I feel like I should throw my arms up. That was such yeah, a great- Yeah, throw your arms up, Woo. <laughs> Scott, how are you doing, man? I'm awesome, man. As you know, I'm a I'm a big admirer of your work. So Thank to, you so to have you sing my praises is just an awesome <laughs> feeling. So I hope that all your students are watching and paying attention. So let's just dive right on in there. I think there are a lot of people who are going to want to know about what the heck we're going to be talking about today. So first, let's start at the top. What is marketing? All right, awesome. I feel like I already need to amend what you've said. Okay, <laughs> what so I'm, what please I'm do, please do. Up. So, so you talked about marketing as the science of exchange, which really is how I like to boil it down. Mm -hmm. But thinking about your background, I really want to call it the art and science of exchange. I like exchange. that. I like it. Yes. So that's probably a little bit better. But mm -hmm. uh, basically, the idea is that in order for marketing to take place, you have to have willing parties exchanging something. The easiest example is I'm exchanging money for goods and services. But there has to be some kind of mutual benefit for each party, so your benefits are outweighing the cost as the seller and the buyer in the simplest example. Mm -hmm. Can we get some examples of where companies may get this whole marketing dynamic wrong, like where it's lopsided? Yeah, for sure. So, and I think if we look at that, the traditional transactional view of marketing, mm -hmm. it used to be looked at as kind of this one-to-many operation without enough input from the consumer side of things. So now we, we look much more at this kind of uh, consultative approach to selling and, and to marketing where we're getting all these inputs from the outside world. We're getting all these inputs from consumers. And instead of all these, you know, we like to draw boxes and arrows as marketers, especially academics, everything's linear. Now it's much more like everything's feeding back into, into each other as, and everything's much more cyclical and dynamic. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I think really what's, what's kind of at the heart of what I do, because I, I specifically studied buyer behavior. So I mentioned that the benefits have to outweigh the costs for each party, but that's not very satisfying because you can see people you know, driving off the lot in a Lamborghini. And of course that has a pretty low objective utility. So it's really about this subjective value. So it's all about perceptions of costs, perceptions of benefits, which I think is why uh, you and me are a really good fit together because you talk a lot about value-based pricing and things right. like that. People get really angry and upset sometimes, <laughs> but do. it really is about managing perceptions. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Since you, you're you're the person who's in academia, I, I just want to know because a lot of this stuff I've learned through books, and I've also learned by doing and being being coached. This is just me doing it in the in the real world, and people do get really upset. And I always find it a little shocking that if I'm talking to creative people and I say, "Go charge what you're worth." They freak out. They think I'm crazy. Uh, I'm a d bag. Um, I, I'm unrealistic and uh, whatever other words that they want to use. Why do you think they're having such a vitriolic um, reaction to the things that I'm saying? Where does that come from? 
And first of all, I just want to apologize for nodding when you're saying things like I'm a D-bag. I'm just kind of nodding because <laughs> I'm following along. You're not agreeing. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I'm not agreeing with what they're saying. But really, I, I think the reason you get that reaction is because of our perceptions of what you do. So let's say, for example, you're creating brand elements for somebody. You're doing this branding package or creating a logo. And I know there's a marketplace out there where I can buy a logo for $50 on Fiverr. Or I know that if I go to someone locally with a Houston agency, maybe I can get a logo for $2,500. So when you talk about charging really high sums of money, people get uncomfortable with that and they think that you're doing something unfair. But I think really the disconnect there is in what the perceived benefit is that you're providing. So if you have this tremendous experience, you've worked with these huge brands, the benefit is not the mark. So it's not that I'm providing you with this tangible logo, you're providing a lot of security and, and different things that people aren't thinking about when they have that kind of sticker shock reaction to, uh, to the price that, you, that you're communicating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so what I understand from value-based pricing is you need to come up with a price that's both fair for the buyer and the seller of whatever it is. So in this case, we're talking about creative services. So if I'm making a logo, this is why the idea of value-based pricing exists because two different buyers will value it very differently. So if I'm a small mom and pop store or a restaurant and I, I need a quick logo and the logo doesn't really have a giant impact on my business and if I get it wrong, I can re do it easily. It's just a couple of business cards or maybe I just quickly swap it out on my website. No problem, no big deal. But if we take it on to the other end of the spectrum when we're talking about, say, an airline or something that's massive, the amounts of uh, pieces of collateral that the logo touches is tremendous. We're talking about tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of printing costs, let alone a, an awareness campaign, a rollout campaign, and all these things that are tied to it. And one example that I, I read recently in Blair N's Pricing Creativity book is this. It's like Tropicana. Tropicana decided to switch their logo and their packaging. So when they switched it, they lost hundreds of thousands, I think they actually lost millions of dollars actually in that first week alone because people could not find the Tropicana sitting on the counter shelf. So, shelf. so that's where like when you get it wrong, it can actually have a real big impact on your business. Where, whereas where a smaller company, changing your logo is really not gonna have much of an impact at all. Exactly. And also you have to think about everything that as a big brand and as a small brand too, what are you getting out of this logo? Because technically anyone can create a logo, right? I can create a Tropicana logo, right. but you have to think about, is it going to be something that's memorable? Is it going to be meaningful? Mm -hmm. Is it something that I can transfer to transfer to other product lines? There, there are all these different considerations. And of course, with a brand like Tropicana, if you were going to do that, that redesign or help them kind of revert to what they've already done, they're going to want a lot of uh, security. They're going to want the, uh, you, you reduce the risk because of your experience with blind.com and your lengthy portfolio. And they know they have all this evidence that you've been able to work successfully with big brands mm -hmm. where maybe the local agency doesn't have that, or maybe the person on, on Fiverr, doesn't, you know, hasn't developed that or hasn't developed it yet. Right. Okay. So I'm going to take a brief moment here to say hello to everybody that's tuning in live on Facebook and on YouTube. They're like, well, is this a mistake? Two live streams in one day? Two? Too much of a good thing? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. It's just how these schedules stacked up, you guys. This is a double feature. This is a double feature live stream. And I also want to tell you guys that both Erica, uh, is Aaron here? Aaron, no, maybe. No. Well, Melissa's here. Melissa's it's back, it. you guys. She's not fired. She's still here, even though she won the bets. If you watch that episode, she did win the bet. She took my money. Now, somebody who was more gracious would have said, no, Chris, please, I'm just grateful for the opportunity. <laughs> Here's your money back. I'm super sorry. I even questioned you in the first place. Well, my wife likes you, so you'll be here for a couple more episodes at least. Anyways, great to see you guys again. So if you guys have a question, please put it into Facebook and on YouTube where we'll be monitoring it. Okay, Scott, let's move on to the next question I have for you here. So why do, don't people like marketing? Why is there such a, like a bad association with marketing? Okay, good. I'm glad you asked this because this is something that my students always bring up early in the class. Mm -hmm. And I actually have created a, a slide deck that kind of revolves around how marketing can be good versus evil. Mm -hmm. Because my students come in and I'll ask them for kind of associations with what they think marketing is. And they'll say things like deception, manipulation, and they'll, they'll say some neutral terms too, like sales. But it really does have this bad it kind does. of snake oil salesman stigma to it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because 
what's available in your memory, it's all the times you got screwed over by marketers, right? So we don't remember the good marketing. We don't remember marketing when it, you know, helped us whittle down a thousand choices to the, the perfect product, the one that we really needed. We, we immediately kind of our mind goes to things like manipulation and deception. Uh, for example, if I ask you about your associations with uh, the automotive industry or VW, you'll think about how they kind of cheated the emissions tests and had this, you know, device capture emissions so right. that they would test and things like that. So, so incidents like that really give marketers a bad name. And those are the things that stick with us and that we have those enduring associations with marketing. If we want to throw it way back to like the 1950s, uh, the, the easiest example of manipulation is having something like subliminal messages for Coca-Cola running during movie advertisements or running during movies. And these advertisements, I think they will they'll make people very uncomfortable. And that's not even gray area. Right. That's like dark area of marketing. But in today's environment, with all the data that are available to marketers, there's so much gray area. And, you know, we see it with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, things right, like right. that. Marketers are constantly kind of dipping their toe into the darker gray and, and really nasty areas of marketing. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what grabs headlines. That's what stands out. You know, even today, we could talk about what IHOP did. Uh, so IHOP, if, if you haven't heard, the International House of Pancakes, they're running this campaign where they they flip the P to a B and they say now we're the International House of Burgers. But of course, if you dig into this, they're not really changing their name permanently. This is a, a marketing a marketing campaign that's trying to get exposure for a line of hamburgers that they're selling now. So it's really interesting. Are they deceiving us by telling us they're actually changing our brand name because they're capturing a ton of media attention right now? They're trending on Twitter all because people look at that tweet and think, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they've rebranded as a burger joint. So mm -hmm. even that is kind of in that gray area of deception, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's when advertising is doing a good job where they're actually going to find some unique thing about the, the product or service and find a clever way to package that and sell it to people so it's memorable because there's a lot of noise out there and you have to be able to cut through that. So now I wasn't thinking about IHOP before this, but now I'm thinking about that burger perhaps. And that's I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. But even if you stay away from the dark, uh, the black hat stuff, if you will, when you get into the dark art of marketing. I even think about telemarketing because the word marketing is in there. And I think about spam. I'm trying to enjoy a night home with my family and, and a robocall is coming in just telling me stuff. And no, I don't. And they just don't let you get off the phone. That's where, and it's really intrusive. And I think they clearly have not thought about the value exchange between what they're offering you and how they can help you versus your time. Right. And, and that, that can, that's another component of why people hate marketing. It's this, this interruption, this intrusion, this annoyance. So even little things like how, how does a marketer make sure that you're paying attention to their stimuli versus everybody else's? You know, there was a time when in TV commercials, some marketers would ratchet up the volume of their commercials so that they stand out from the TV program you're watching or so that you stand out from the other commercials. And then, of course, what happens is everybody does the same thing. And then we have to have federal regulations that that say this is the maximum volume you can have. But mm -hmm. it, it is like you said, there's so much noise. It's this fight for exposure and attention. And we also get a lot of things in marketing like repetition. You remember the the head on apply directly to the forehead commercials where we heard that message like it felt like thousands of times every week and it drives us crazy. But of course, it also makes that brand memorable and it makes people talk about it when they're with their friends or when they're out at work. So it it is annoying. But if it's working, then how can you expect marketers not to do it, especially when it's not unethical? Right. Let's talk about another pet peeve of mine is waste. Oftentimes, I get these massive tomes, these catalogs from Restoration Hardware. Now, I do, I do like looking at them, but I don't want to see one in my inbox or not my inbox, my mailbox every quarter because it's massively wasteful in terms of the, the printing and ink and all that kind of stuff. I don't need that per se. How do we respond or how do we feel about things like that? Right. Absolutely. And, and you you have rights as a consumer, so you can you can uh, download an app and kind of scan the label and send it in and then never receive that catalog again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you can contact Restoration Hardware directly. But of course, you're 
you're kind of uh, poking at a bigger problem here in that we're creating all of this marketing material. And you know, as everything kind of moves online, it, it may be getting a little bit better. Uh, but, but maybe even a, a bigger issue would be something like single serving packages. So we know as marketers that we can extract more profit and we can appeal to customers by having everything available in single servings. But most customers aren't thinking about the landfills and the pollution in the ocean that's coming from this single serve packaging. So while a company like Coca-Cola might have these great recycling programs and say, you know, we have these targets to reduce waste to zero. The reality is that if they weren't creating so much single serving packaging in the first place, we wouldn't have such a, a massive issue to deal with. Mm -hmm. And one nice thing about differentiation uh, in the marketplace is that we are seeing brands now that can be successful by saying, hey, we don't generate as much waste or we don't use unnecessary packaging or or provide all these security measures that, you know, make it really hard to, to get into the package and generate all this you know, landfill waste. Yeah, I'm seeing that, say, like even in the razor blade market space, like uh, for, for shaving your face, how there seems to be this movement towards those uh, safety razors because there's no plastic housing they're saying that these companies that are marketing to you three five seven blades fusion jet 55 whatever it's called these days is that those things cannot be broken down to be recycled and it's just a marketing gimmick that for you know for a very long time we've used a straight edge razor or safety razor to cut to shave our face and it's worked just fine so again there's the issue of waste and being a little bit more eco-friendly or conscious or conscientious um, that's also a marketing ploy in and of itself, isn't it? Yes, and that that actually is how we refer to similar marketing strategies. So the the, the razor blade kind of uh, strategy is something that's used for things like Barbie dolls, right? When you you sell the Barbie at a reasonable price, but then all the accessories cost a ton of money. So you're not really making your money on the initial doll or right. on the initial razor. You're making money on blades, and you're making money on you know, clothing and cars and Barbie dream houses and, and things like that. But one really cool thing about where we are in 2018 is that consumer awareness is also at an all time high. So it's easier for consumers to kind of rise up and have a voice and say, hey, we're tired of you know, replacing our razor blades every month or every two, you know, depending on what you're using every every few weeks, every few months, uh, we, we want a different solution. And then competitors can kind of heed the call. And that, that's where we get into um, part partly get into the bright side of marketing is that it, it creates competition mm -hmm. and competition generally is going to be good for us as consumers. Mm. So some very smart company, some brand out there is listening to people's reaction and because we're all on social now we're sharing our, our thoughts and opinion they don't they don't even need to do focus groups anymore they can just listen socially and see like wow uh, there must be a better way and so some enterprising company or brand out there can say like we'll, we'll make the solution to that because it seems like that's a big enough problem and then things change for the better so that's a, that's another or that's an example of why marketing is good is there another reason that you could think of why marketing is good yeah, I think that so sometimes marketing gets criticized for the choice overload, mm -hmm. but I think most of us to some extent are variety seeking. So we don't want if you imagine you're in the market for a new car, mm -hmm. you don't want to have you know, two brands to choose from. You like having this variety that, um, you know, with all these different segments being targeted, and that's good for you because it helps you ultimately generate a choice set that's right for you. And then there's tons of information available that's gonna help you make that final purchase decision. So generally, marketing is providing us with a lot of information about products that's there for us to use or not use. Um, and and as, as consumers, if we embrace that, uh, generally it's gonna be good for us and, and help us make better decisions. Of course, this is discounting the fact that much of the time we're making irrational decisions, kind of non-conscious decisions. Like imagine walking through the grocery store. If you consciously thought about every product that you were picking up and putting in your cart, it would take you four hours to get through the grocery store every time that you went. So you're relying on some kind of shortcuts that you've developed over the years based on familiarity and, and um, you know, I know this brand or my, my parents bought this brand or uh, my spouse buys this brand. So we're making decisions like that. Or maybe we'll decide based on price or package color or just positioning on the store shelf. So, so there's kind of two sides to that coin. But I would argue that information generally is, is going to help us as, as consumers. Mm -hmm. Now that you were talking about going down the 
supermarket and thinking about all these brands kind of flooding into our brains, we do have brand preferences and brand affinities uh, towards different things. So I remember my business coach told me before, I can't remember which book it was, maybe it was The Tipping Point or something. It's one of these uh, books where he talks about advertisers know this thing where if they make some strange association with their product and service, they're very hard to shake. And I'll give you an example. Snickers sure. ran a campaign for a very long time and they still talk about it. Uh, they used to run this thing that says Snickers satisfies. Like if you're hungry, Snickers with its peanuts and caramel nougat, when you're hungry, it really satisfies your hunger. And that probably isn't true at all. But when I'm walking <laughs> through the store and I'm thinking, I just need a little snack, I'm kind of hungry. The first thing that pops in my mind is Snickers. So they've done a very good job of invading me. And I even know it. I'm aware of it. I'm cognizant of it, but I can't help but to, to, to recognize that that's there. Or Twix is like, share one. There's two bars. And so it's like anytime I'm thinking, I don't want a full bar, but I could share one. And so That's those right. are those thoughts that you're talking about, right? We all connect with certain brands of I detergent. I never share so. one. <laughs> you take both. Yes. Uh, so share a Coke with Chris and then <laughs> drink it. <laughs> right? So they're very good at kind of invading our subconscious thought and kind of That's right. making a home there in our in our mind. So um, I, I remember you... Brand, go ahead. Uh, and brands are also very good at associating moods and emotions mm -hmm. with their their brand, their packaging, their brand name. Uh, think about Super Bowl commercials. What is it now? Like something like 80% of them are making an, uh, an emotional appeal over a rational appeal. So if you remember a few years back, Dodge Ram had this commercial that was, um, it was an old Paul Harvey speech, God Made a oh, Farmer. Yes. Yeah. And it, it was really powerful. It was about working the land and kind of like going back to your roots. And like, you know, it was this really strong blue collar message that, you know, had a lot of pride built into it. And then at the end, it's like uh, Dodge Ram, right? And they're kind of, they're driving bales of hay around in Dodge Rams and things like that. So we make this really heavy handed emotional appeal, hoping that's, that that's going to have some kind of enduring association with Dodge Ram next time that, that you're ready to buy that pickup truck. And, and that can be really powerful and it can work beneath the surface, which is where we as consumers, when we're aware of what's happening, can start to feel a little bit manipulated or, or a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and, and think about, this may be an oversimplification, but we all kind of have these memory networks, you know, made of connected nodes in our mind. And we, we talked about Coca-Cola a little bit earlier, but you know, when you're walking down that soda aisle and out of the corner of your eye, you see the color red, right away, you know it's Coca-Cola, right? That association right. with red in the soda category is so powerful. Or if you're driving down the highway and you see a red and white billboard, you don't even process that consciously, but you know it's Coca-Cola. And then it's one more exposure, right? Like another feather in the Coca-Cola cap for kind of reminding you that Coca-Cola exists. And the next time I try to make my decision, I'm not gonna think about it, but I'm probably gonna go for the Coca-Cola. Right. This is a great episode for sponsors. <laughs> we have no sponsors. Shoot, there's no sponsorship. All of this is uh, unpaid testimony, unfortunately. Uh, Melissa, are there any comments or questions coming in from Facebook or YouTube that you feel like we need to address right now, or should we keep rolling? Um, how would you express your own value from entry level, mid level, or experienced graphic designer or artist? No. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, never mind. She takes yeah. that one back. But <laughs> Melissa, make sure the mic is pointed at your mouth. Oh, okay. It, it works much better when it, yeah, there you go. Um, well, I actually have a question because you just talked about associations and um, I, I got my MFA in marketing. So um, I wanted to know what you think about how brands are positioning themselves now as personalities, as people, not not brands, but they're actually personifying or embodying a brand. Like Kim Kardashian, like she's a brand and people buy things that are made by her because they know her. So how do you feel or can, can you elaborate on that kind of transition? Sure, yeah, and there definitely has been a transition thanks to social media. So it used to be that really the, the, the brand and celebrity endorser working together, this was controlled more on the brand side of things, right? So the brand would kind of, um, you know, poll who is the most famous and who kind of fits with our brand, they'd go after them. But now the celebrities are kind of building up their own personal brand on Instagram and Twitter and all these different domains. And it's not just like you're a movie star, it's not just 
you're from TV or you're a pop star or a hip hop star or whatever the case may be. Now people know you, right? And, and personalization is so powerful. So um, uh, uh, Chrissy Teigen responded to uh, one of my friends on Twitter the other day and he has like a thousand followers and he thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So next time she gets a celeb endorsement, right? He's gonna be like tuned in and feel like they're, they're great friends because of that one little interaction they had. And before that was not possible because we had, everything was kind of one to many. It was the movie to the masses, the TV show to the masses, the song to the masses. But now we have these personal brands that are out there engaging with individual consumers. They're engaging with each other. They're engaging with people who are like you. So it doesn't even have to be this direct connection. If somebody you know who's super famous is tweeting at Chris Doe and I feel like I'm connected to Chris dough in some way, I'm going to find that to be really cool. And I'm going to be more likely to, to listen to what they have to say. They're building up their credibility. The other side of that coin is that, you know, if I'm a celebrity and I'm really active on social media and I'm like hyper political, uh, I, I have a risk now where I can turn people off where before it was like they were, they were just looking at, you know, the roles that I was cast in or, or the songs that I was singing. So uh, they're, they're probably not even calculating the risks, but but there are risks associated with personal branding now. Anything else, Melissa? No, that I, that was really cool. Thank you. I think this is perfect since you are a marketing MFA and Scott's a marketing PhD. I think the two of you guys can be very academic and ask each other all <laughs> kinds of questions because this is the farthest away that I've ever been in terms of knowing a particular subject. We do what we do well, mostly by gut instinct uh, through some books and trial and error. But Chris, can I ask you a question? Because I'm yeah. not that familiar with the creative space. So we started out by talking about why people think marketing is bad. And we got uh, we dug in a little bit to value-based pricing. Mm -hmm. But are there other, other acts that are specific to your business where people think marketers are, are being dishonest or creatives are, are using manipulation or exaggeration to, to their detriment? I don't know if our audience, uh, to be honest, is even that sophisticated. I think our, our general association with marketing is probably around advertising. That's the, okay. the one to many option that we first talked about and it seems to be a dying form of communication. It's, it's very impersonal. And even today, like when you're on Facebook, you can do micro-targeted ads towards very specific groups, generate 30 different ads for men, for women from different age groups and really make the message much more personal to them. And to me, Marketing or advertising is, is bad when it's intrusive, when it doesn't add value to my life. Whereas if I'm looking for something, like you said, like part of choice architecture or helping me make a decision, I think it's good, really good then. For example, if I'm looking at a lens or a gimbal for, for what I'm doing to shoot video on, and then all of a sudden I see in my feed a bunch of different articles or things around lenses and cameras and testimonies, testimonials, then I think, hey, this is pretty cool. This helps me to make my decision, and I think that's cool. That's probably through some retargeting or cookie campaign that they're running. But to me, right. that is the form of advertising that seems to work. Right. And and there is a line there at some point, right? Because right. there's kind of this balance between between privacy and useful uh, usefulness to us as consumers. Uh, and we're going to see this more and more and more. So if in 10 years, if 10 years from now, we all have chips implanted in our bodies and they know when we're sick and then pharmaceutical companies are pinging us and trying to sell us their drugs directly, right? That's going to feel really nasty. That's right. going to feel like really nefarious marketing. Mm -hmm. But if it's like you said, I'm just looking for something in this product category and oh, by the way, here's this perfect product that's just popping up on my feed, that can be really satisfying because I, I'm sure you remember in like the, the late 90s, early 2000s, those days of the internet, we were exposed to so much advertising that was completely irrelevant. And, and personal relevance is what really gets our attention as, as consumers. Mm -hmm. I guess if you look at it as they're trying to sell me something, that's going to be annoying. That might be invading my personal space and my information. But if it's providing a solution to a problem I have, a lot of what Google and Apple does now is very predictive, right? When I get in my car, I didn't have to tell it that I'm going home. It just knows around this time I'm, I head home. It tells me the traffic, the estimated travel time, and alternate routes. Also, when I, when I purchase a ticket, it adds it to my calendar without even me doing anything. These things I do not see as invasive. Uh, I see it as helpful. So in, in some ways, some of this stuff can be seen almost as assisting or aiding me in, in the kind of information-rich, time-poor life that I live. So I think then it's perfectly fine. It's welcome. 
That's right. And that, and that keeps reducing the, the cost part of the equation for you, right? So we have time costs and we have effort costs. So when marketers can save us time or reduce the effort that we're putting into a decision, we generally think of that as a positive for us as consumers. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the, the boundaries have to be respected and incidents where those boundaries aren't respected is where the reputation of marketers comes from, which, which I think is unfortunate. Right. Like marketing, like most things, isn't inherently good or bad. It's how you use it and the intention behind it. So this is where I think uh, you said this earlier on, where it gets a bad rap because the things that stick out are the things that are really annoying. They get a lot of press and just put a blemish within the profession or, the, or what it is that, that you do. So I got a couple of questions here for you. You're sure. a professor of marketing. You're teaching. Are you teaching undergrad or graduate students? I teach both. Okay. So in terms in terms of volume, most of my students are MBAs. Okay. Uh, I, I teach about um, three different MBA courses per year and two different undergrad courses per year. Okay. So let's just say for whatever reason, tomorrow I'm like, you know what? I need to go get a master's degree. I want to learn more about marketing. What is it that you're sharing with people that are going to help them in their career? Right. And, and this is where we can kind of dig into mm -hmm. where marketing academia gets a bad rap okay. in that sometimes we're criticized because we're disconnected from what's happening in the real world. So like I said, at the top of the show, we're dealing in boxes and arrows and, and that kind of thing where that might not be that practically useful to you out in the real world. But I do think that the value we add as professors, obviously variance from professor to professor, university to university, but we really teach you marketing strategy, how to think about marketing strategy, uh, you know, segmentation, targeting, positioning, competition, all those things. We might not be good at telling you how am I going to run this campaign on Instagram or how am I going to improve my presence on Snapchat or capture the, the hearts and minds of the, the 15 to 20 year old demographic? Those are more tactics. But I think on the strategic side, if you if you look at people who've kind of come out in the world and had success as marketers and you sit down and talk to them, some of them are going to have sound strategy. Many of them will have serendipity on their side. So they were kind of in the right place at the right time with the right product, but there wasn't a lot of conscious strategy behind it. So what we're really teaching, especially at the MBA level, is how to form, how to formulate and communicate conscious strategy. Mm. Okay, so I, I know you mentioned a little bit about tactics. So if I, I, and I'm a believer in this, and I think Facebook is one of the smartest ad advertising platforms out there. Google knows a little bit about you, but Facebook seems to know everything about you and the ability to segment your audience to give them a very individualized message or one that appears that way is very, very powerful. You have very rich data and analytics. Are you going to go that deep in the MBA program to teach people the platform? Because things are changing all the time. Right. So it's it's it depends. Like I said, it depends on the program. Mm -hmm. Some programs are very focused on marketing analytics. But if you're getting a, a general MBA, you're probably not going to have that exposure. If you're getting an MBA that has a marketing and sales specialization, you will have some exposure there. So for me, I'm not teaching a marketing analytics course right now. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll team up with uh, Eric San Anosencio, who's the, the digital marketing manager for the Houston Texans NFL football team. Mm -hmm. And I'll bring him into the classroom to talk to my students or I'll, I'll hop on a, a live chat with him, something like that to give my students the exposure to, OK, we've learned the principles. Now, this is how this is going to work in the real world. And I think that now that we're tearing down the technology barriers, you're going to see a lot more of this happening in the classroom because mm. I don't have to fly somebody in from Seattle or San Francisco to come talk to my class about modern marketing analytics in the real world. I can hop on a Zoom call or a Google Hangout and then have that, that information waiting for my students. Just for example, the, the pricing discussion that we had, the value-based pricing discussion, to make that, that, that unit of our textbook real for our students, I, that's mandatory viewing for them. So I have, I have Chris Doe exam questions uh, for my MBA. <laughs> I hope I don't ever have to take that exam myself. I might fail. <laughs> so you're saying like we can use platforms like the ones that we're using right now. We're talking via Zoom, broadcasting through Wirecast. So we're able to close distances and time differences as well. Super cool. Um, Melissa. That's right. And yes. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, uh, how does what Scott is saying compare to the education you got? Uh, I understand what you're saying on a business level. Um, I, my degree differs because I got it from an art school. So you 
probably are teaching it from a solely business perspective. Whereas when I went to Savannah College of Art and Design, I learned the business and the visual aspect of it. So I learned that the business strategy has to be executed through the graphic visual strategy of it. And uh, what I learned was um, like the social media tactics that you would use, you know, and the engagement. A lot of the trending um, topics and books that I read for my, for my thesis were based upon interactive engagement, you know, like on the next level, such as game design, you know, when it comes to social media, because that's like another level of marketing. It's not, it's, uh, what's the word? You know, it's elus no, elusive or uh, you wouldn't think that it's a marketing tactic, but it is. For instance, like the Glue mobile games they have based on celebrities. You know, you play their games. And then so an effect of that would be like you would go to the store and you buy their music or you buy anything associated with them because you are playing their video game and you want to actually live it in your life, which makes you want to buy the products. Absolutely. And I, I actually think that's a cool perspective, what you did in your marketing program. I think we need more of a mix because right now you can, um, you know, if you go through our MBA program, you're definitely going to take a class in marketing management, marketing strategy. But if you're not specialized in marketing, for example, you won't have integrated marketing communications where we really do talk about uh, CRMs and different social media channels and bringing creatives as guest speakers and things like that. Of course, there's a trade off right with time. We only have students for two years. So we really have to make sure that we teach them the fundamentals and kind of this bigger picture of, of how to think as a business person. Mm -hmm. So if you're in finance, and I force you to go through my class where I'm teaching you, um, you know, Facebook tactics or how to use a specific design platform, they're going to look at that as kind of a waste of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Uh, there's a question coming here from YouTube. I think it's a good question, Scott. It may be too tactical, but let's see. HXT Sauce Brand Design asks, when you have a certain target demographic, how do you find what magazines and books they read or know where they browse online? What tools do you use to find this information? Okay, so uh, th this is where I'm going to show the disconnect between <laughs> Here we go. And the first question. <laughs> I, love I, it. Honest, I honestly would, would talk to other people or I would talk to uh, magazines directly. So um, one thing I actually caution students against is using their intuition to do too much. But for me, if I'm if I if I know what my target demographic looks like, uh, I would I would start to pull magazines that I think are appealing to that target demographic and then reach out to them for data. Right. But there there are databases, both academic and real world, that are probably going to show me this information. But I can't put a name on them right now because that's, that's not what I do, uh, unfortunately. Right. Now, I was speaking to uh, an inventor. He, he's in the app tech space. He does something really cool. And I was asking him how he's marketing. And he said that one strategy he uses is he gives Google and Facebook uh, like 100 of his best customers email. And he doesn't know anything else about them except for he gives them their email address. And then they find an audience for him, which is pretty cool. Uh, That's right. So based on just that, so the larger the sample of customers you have, the better they can do in terms of matching you. And so what's really cool is he'll use those 100 names to then advertise on, say, Facebook or, you, or, or on uh, Google, and he'll grow a new, a new audience base that expands on who he has, and then he feeds those new names back in. So the data is getting richer and, and more uh, refined in terms of who they're looking for and who's more likely to buy something from them. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. And the evolution of that's been really interesting. If you remember back in the, the early days of Facebook advertising, we were looking at you know, demographics. So it's males and females right. in this age range with this occupation. And then as we got a little bit more sophisticated and Facebook started being uh, a little more open with their data, we would start targeting other brands that we thought that our customers or our target market would be interested in. And that turned out to be much more powerful. But now it's like you said, I can upload an audience. And then once the platform understands the composition of that audience, they can create a much broader audience for my message. Mm -hmm. um, that can feel uncomfortable for some people, especially with Facebook in the news and sure. in modern times. Uh, but but really, that, that power of personalization, that's going to keep growing and growing and growing. Right. Uh, Matt Kendall, based on this 
uh, discussion or this line of thought here. He's like, I'd like to get Scott's opinion on the future of advertising, especially with the recent Facebook privacy stuff. What's going to happen there, Scott? What do you see? Yeah, so with, with Facebook specifically, I think that they're not done yet. And we, we keep seeing smaller stories pop up about data breaches and, and Facebook giving access to uh, maybe unsavory marketers who shouldn't have had access to the data. Mm -hmm. I actually foresee turmoil and more turmoil sometime in the next year or two. Um, it might result in Zuckerberg actually standing down as CEO. Um, but I, I do think that, well, even with GDRP, we've seen so much refinement of privacy policies now. My hope is that in five years, as consumers, we're actually going to understand both the value of our data and how our data is being used. Because I think that right now, those things are in a black box and we either um, don't care or don't have access as consumers. But as the awareness keeps going up and up and up for consumers, I think companies are, whether they want to or not, going to be more forthright about what they're collecting, what they're sharing with third parties. And it's it's going to be actually interpretable. It's not going to be obfuscated by uh, marketing language and, and, and legalese. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Melissa, are there any other questions coming in? Uh, they're pretty active here. I can't monitor them all. all uh, of them. Is there anything else? Or you can ask a personal question because you know more about this than I do. Yeah, thank you for telling <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for telling you something you may or may not know. <laughs> um, I, um, can, can I can I put a bit in that? Let me think about it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing, just while it's while it's top of mind for me, so we mm -hmm. were talking about what makes marketing good, mm -hmm. and we we started early in the conversation talking a little bit about transactional marketing, where firms were really they were trying to capture your mind so that you would perceive that their quality is greater than the competitor's quality, and this was all kind of driven by this goal of profitability. And then in the 1990s, 2000s, we saw this evolution to loyalty, right? So now the, the brands are after your heart. They want you to feel this, this enduring affinity. Things kind of started to shift toward loyalty programs and making sure that you're retaining your existing customers. Mm -hmm. And I think right now what we're seeing is maybe the most interesting shift yet where marketers are after the spirit. So they want you to feel like they're doing good in the world. Uh, and this is more, it's not about just profitability and not just about loyalty, but it's about sustainability. And we talked a little bit about this when you mentioned the, the importance of waste to you. But you look at companies that are really thriving, even locally for me, I'm in Houston and, and Gallery Furniture is a, a pretty high-end furniture store here. And uh, the, the owner, Mattress Mac, is world famous for all of the philanthropy that he does in Houston. Mm -hmm. During Hurricane Harvey, uh, gallery furniture sent their trucks out to rescue people from the, uh, from the storm waters. They brought them back to the showroom and then they opened up the showroom for anybody in Houston to go sleep on brand new Tempur-Pedic mattresses and furniture. And I just thought that that was so cool. And, and, and just telling you a little bit about the profitability side of it, Mattress Mac came and talked to an, at an event that I attended and he said that they got four billion free media exposures from their efforts during Hurricane Harvey. So I think marketers now are becoming much more savvy about, hey, how can I actually do something that's good for this community, that's good for this planet, knowing that it's also gonna, gonna lift the bottom line. Mm -hmm. How do you ride that line between doing it in a sincere, genuine way versus like, hey, I know how to get a lot of attention, let's do this thing. And it's hard to tell like what's in somebody's mind, right? And they could it's, do it because that's really what they want to do. Right. Yeah. And there are brands you have an affinity for where you just feel like from the top, they're doing it for the right reasons. Uh, and, and it's probably nuanced even in their own mind. Right. So and, and even Mattress Mac, he'll do things like um, you can kind of gamble on the local teams, the Houston Astros. And mm -hmm. if they win the World Series, you get free furniture, things like that. So obviously he's a showman and a savvy marketer and, and he's thinking about these things. But I think just the way he talks to people the way he's there day to day, people feel like it's sincere, but really, again, it's about perception. So perceived authenticity, does it feel fake? Does it feel like they're just trying to push stuff? That's not gonna be very effective for you. But if you have this enduring relationship with your customer base, that's gonna resonate with people. That's gonna make you very relevant and, and available in their, in their mind when mm -hmm. they're making decisions. Mm -hmm. I know a little while back during the flooding, 
uh, Joel Osteen was out on his yacht handing out Bibles to people when well, <laughs> their houses were underwater. So, like that, that probably did not go well. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, some of the some of the bad rap that he's taken, I don't know how much of it's warranted, right. but he had a huge social media backlash because they did he has a mega church here in Houston mm-hmm. and they did not immediately open their doors to the public, which, you know, in the spirit of giving, that's kind of what you think that a church that has a lot of available room will do. Uh, they later came out and said, I don't I don't know the efficacy of the statement, but they later came out and said that uh they had experienced some flooding and they couldn't really safely open to the public. Uh, and they, they ultimately did a few days later or a couple days later after the backlash. But yes, that was the, that was the perfect counter to what Mattress Mac had done, getting all this, you know, 4 billion impressions of positive publicity. And then if you search Joel Osteen or his ministry <laughs> yes. at that time, it was, it was just a torrent of negative press. That was a bad one. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Very bad. And who knows, like you said, there, there could be very valid reasons, but it, the optics of it did not look good for him right. at all. Okay. Although I think part of, part of it has to do with the way you set up your organization. Mm-hmm. So if you're a values-based organization, if you've clearly defined your mission and vision up front, then the, what you're going to do comes pretty naturally. So people would ask Mattress Mac, for, for, we should have done advertising for this show, like you said. <laughs> people would... <laughs> People would ask Mattress Mac, they'd say, how could you open up your showroom with all this expensive furniture to just anybody off the street? And his brilliant response is, how could I not? Right. Because mm-hmm. it's like, this is my home. This is my community. So and, and he this, this these are the values that are ingrained in his business. If you're trying to do it backwards, like, oh, OK, I need to improve my profitability. How can I tie that to some kind of values in the community or how can I make it look like I'm doing social good I think you're less likely to come off as authentic right right okay so I think you've mentioned a couple of things uh, in terms of the mind uh, being better the heart being different and the spirit probably the most important one is making a difference right Right. Absolutely. So uh, how am I actually making a difference Mm -hmm. beyond being profitable, beyond having a loyal customer base? And this is where we're savvy consumers now. We're we're monitoring just as much as the brands are on social media, everything that's happening. You know, Mashable is is watching like a hawk to see how brands are going to respond in different situations. So so we're very tuned in to what brands are making a difference, you know, Patagonia, they're, they're giving back money to the environment. They're donating a, a certain percentage of their proceeds. They're, they're shying away from traditional forms of intrusive advertising. We key in on that as consumers and we have so much more access to that information than we did even five or 10 years ago. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I want to get into this other part of the, your conversation or our conversation together, which is about understanding customers. What does that mean to you? Understanding right, customers. So- so, so my PhD is in consumer psychology, consumer behavior, mm-hmm. and you know everything in marketing has this central node, this focal point on customers. And especially when in today's modern environment, we're having more of these very close relationships with our customers, they're going to inform everything that we do. And of course, they're going to respond to everything that we do. So my field is concerned with understanding what motivates customers, uh, what kinds of stimuli we should be putting in front of customers, uh, what kinds of stimuli they actually pay attention to, how we can shape their perceptions, how we can spin those positive perceptions into things that really matter like sales, right? And, and, and really it's just kind of understanding um, if you're familiar with behavioral economics, and I know you've read a ton of books on, on marketing, so, so you have a lot of exposure to, to books like Influence by Robert Cialdini, and, right, right. Uh, and, uh, and you've probably have seen some work from Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, so uh, there, there's all kinds of cool stuff marketers have borrowed from the world of psychology to better understand consumers. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, this is also the part of marketing that, that provides that negative tint sometimes. Uh, but but it certainly can be used for good as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Is there anything else you want to talk about in terms of uh, customers and understanding them besides their motivation? Uh, what about decision making biases and heuristics? Yeah. So even when we were talking about going through the through the grocery store, it's kind of like when you're driving a car. Mm-hmm. If you're paying attention to you know every time you flip the turn signal, every pump of the brake, every every uh, the amount of pressure you're putting on the accelerator, you're going to get into an accident every time you get in the car. It's like a new driver, right? They're so aware of everything that's happening in their surrounding 
surroundings mm-hmm. that it's like they freeze up and they can't really perform well. It's the same thing in a, in a shopping context or in a buying context. We need all these shortcuts. Mm-hmm. So if, if you name your product a Z28 and I have this association with a combination of letters and numbers being something that's really high tech, mm-hmm. that can be helpful, right? It seems kind of weird, but that can really help me out. Or if my association is that, um, you know, when we went to the grocery as a kid, my mother would buy a gallon of milk with a red cap. And now to make that decision quick and easy for me, I buy the milk with the red cap when I go to uh, to Kroger or HEB or Whole Foods, then, then that could be useful for me because it saves time and it prevents me from kind of seizing up in in this environment where, where I could be overloaded by choice. Mm-hmm. So we have all these little things that help us make shortcuts. Uh, availability is a really powerful one. So if I was telling you this very vivid story about how a brand screwed me over, next time you were making a choice and that brand was in your consideration set, you probably wouldn't go with them because that's the thing that's that's available to you top of mind in, in your memory. Mm-hmm. Well, let's take this moment and see if there's any questions that are coming from our audience that are tuning in live on Facebook and on YouTube. Melissa, what do they got for us? Um, there aren't um, a lot of questions that are that differ from what you've already spoke of. Uh-huh. Um, Professor Davis, is that how I should call you? Yeah, <laughs> call him Dr. Davis. No. Just Dr. 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 Davis. Hi, yes. I'm Melissa. Nice to meet you. <laughs> um, uh, there we'll consider this uh, this talk to be comprehensive then. If we <laughs> <laughs> no, well, well, what you're saying, there have been a lot of awesome questions. I don't feel the need to to repeat them though, because I feel like the topics that you've discussed are more of the theoretical cons- um, answers, responses that that feed the questions or um, that that respond to the questions. You know. Um, I know that you can't answer every little detail of a question, but the the concept concepts that you're covering about marketing they uh, are just the fundamental uh, principles of marketing. Um, so, but what you said re- right now about choice and decision making and quick decision making. So that reminds me of the book, The Paradise, The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz. Have you heard of that book before? Have you read it? Yes, I've read that book. So, um, do you think... She's checking your credentials, Doctor. <laughs> That's really right, is. I know. <laughs> well, you know. Let's get on with the question, Melissa. Come on, you're killing us with the filler. Let's do it. What's the question? The question is, do you feel that small companies are now going to thrive because the positioning of bigger companies have... Uh, their reputation has been uh, tarnished because of their greedy, you know, marketing schemes and stuff. Whereas smaller companies that are new, they can position themselves in a new, fresh perspective, you know, or a fresh angle. Do you think that because of this change in consumerism, that we're going to see more smaller companies, or uh, and the death of big corporations? I, I don't think we're going to see the death of corporations. And we have a lot of evidence of that in our real world. Just think about a company like Amazon, right? But it is nice because I, I think what you're suggesting is that uh, we have huge positioning gaps, right? Where where companies, these these mega corporations are providing a, a certain set of attributes that we, we value or we don't as consumers. But then let's say we want a company that now suddenly is responsible in the environment like Chris was looking for earlier that creates an opportunity for a small business. Of course, they're going to have far fewer resources. So while it is possible to kind of sneak in with, with a certain positioning and grow and become you know, one, of the, one of the larger companies, you could also be acquired or once you become noticed by the large corporations, they can start mimicking what you're doing. They can spin off a subsidiary to, to do what you were trying to do uh, a little bit better. So there, there are risks with that. But I, I think we're going to see the, the continuation of, of huge corporations kind of intermingling in this world with with small businesses but but certainly and and one cool thing about marketing is like you can enter a space and say oh my gosh how am i ever going to compete with a company like zappos Uh, i'm never going to be able to you know be able to eat the shipping costs for having free returns well that's okay you just have to find a different way to position yourself so maybe you find a better way to make one-on-one connections with your customers and you're you're calling them you know constantly to follow them up uh, follow up with them something that zappos just couldn't possibly do because of their vast size so there are there are always opportunities to sneak in 
as a small business with different positioning, which I think is encouraging as long as there's a market there um, kind of waiting for you. Mm -hmm. You were talking about this before because the market doesn't always solve its own problems. So the customer is going to say, I have a problem with the long wait. Uh, maybe the usability of a particular app or the quality of the product and service isn't as good as we want it to be. That's where the smaller, more nimble person or company can move in and address a particular smaller audience and actually grow their business from doing that. And that's this cycle repeats itself over and over again, right? Uh, this is how that's we get right. new companies and, and new ideas. And one cool thing about marketing is that consumers don't have to ask for it. So some of the coolest stuff that we've seen in terms of really radical innovation, it's marketers have created needs consumers did not yet know they had. Mm -hmm. So just think about, you know, the iPhone one when it launches, right. we didn't really think about how, hey, we need a music player on our phones and we need this, you know, we or need camera the touch screen or the camera, all the, and all these are just basic needs now that are being satisfied by every phone. But at the time, if you sent out a survey to consumers, they wouldn't have asked for those things. If you said, what attributes do you want in your next phone? They wouldn't have mentioned any of that stuff, right? So that so that's one cool thing about marketing is that you know through some um, just really intuitive uh, inventors or marketers, people like Steve Jobs, you can come up with these cool products that consumers needed, but they just couldn't articulate it yet. Mm -hmm. That's something that um, that Malcolm Gladwell gave a TED talk about. You know, when he was talking about uh, spaghetti sauces, and he said people don't people want like chunky spaghetti sauce or like thin you know or, or different spices like there are different pepsis you know like he was talking about different varieties of the same pro product and extending the product line to, to right. fit those needs and people don't know what they want you know and it is up for us marketers to understand those kind of things that they can't verbalize that's absolutely right. And and sometimes you mentioned the paradox of choice. Uh, sometimes there's an illusion of choice too, where we'll have, if you ever go to the water aisle at Whole Foods and they have all these bottled waters and you know some of them are 365 everyday value, which is their private label, but they'll also have brands like Stucky and Whole Foods owns that, or I guess Amazon owns it now. So it's like, it looks like we have a lot of choice available to us as consumers, but if you really kind of follow the path up to the parent brand, you'll find that you know Procter & Gamble actually owns all this crap that, that you're seeing in this particular aisle, which I, I think is another interesting thing uh, to consider because we talked a little bit about mega brands. Yeah, at, yeah, at, yeah. At, uh, I got a question here from Jake Hawks. He said, can you talk about AI and marketing? Yeah, so a marketing is is the territory for AI where mm -hmm. I think there's the most fear. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're working in the field as a marketer, you're worried that AI is going to replace you because we see all these things built into our customer relationship management CRM systems that uh, are being replaced by AI. So now AI can actually handle some of our decision making processes, and that's scary. And we think about where that's going to be in five years, and and maybe it can be even scarier. But, but one thing that I say to kind of uh, suit, try to soothe the concerns of, of would-be marketers, think about the hardest things for AI to replicate or for AI, the hardest tasks for AI to perform. You get things like creativity and persuasion and uh, original thought, right? Like all these things that we attribute to the field of marketing are really hard for AI to, re to replace or for AI to mimic. And it's, I'm not gonna say it's never gonna happen, but it's gonna take a very long time. And if you wanna get like way over on the art side, even if we have AI that's creating incredible artwork, that's not gonna be that satisfying for us as an end consumer to know that a robot produced this piece of art, right? We wanna feel like a human being's heart went into this. So I think there's always gonna be a room for, for humans in marketing. And of course we can't say the same for, uh, for some other industries and manufacturing, right? Being, being the most obvious. Um, but yeah, yeah that, that's, that's kind of my, perspective, my short perspective on it. Okay, super. Melissa, were you gonna say something? Uh, no, but there was a question about what uh, count, do you have any predictions about the future of marketing rather than how to play the current game, especially since you just talked about artificial intelligence? So do you have any predictions on the future of marketing? I, let me think. So um, I, I don't know if I have any predictions beyond what I just said that, that specifically relate to AI, mm -hmm. but I do think to, 
to compete with what AI is doing, again, in those areas of things like creativity, uh, originality, persuasion, that maybe we are going to see more kind of grassroots marketing. So right now we're, we're used to this kind of mega marketing monolith that's going to be, you know, in the in the dystopian future, like everything's run automatically by robots. Uh, imagine like when you go into Denny's restaurant and everything is is run by robot waiters, that's going to be unsatisfying for certain portions of the population. So it's going to be like, that's going to be a differentiating point in the future. It's like, come to our old school restaurant where we have a human staff that actually has a, a personalized relationship with you. So I do think that down the road, we're going to see a movement back toward a human touch as things kind of go further and further into the AI space. Sales is a good example too. So you probably are inundated with automated sales messages. Some of them you don't even know they're automated. Um, you know, some of the stuff Google's doing to like mimic human behavior so that you don't even know that you're talking to code, right? Uh, is, is kind of interesting and, and scary. But as consumers become more aware of what, what's happening, some of them are going to be seeking out human involvement. So I think that'll be kind of an interesting shift to watch. Mm -hmm. Well, I was thinking about that, that the, the market swings uh, and, the, and the pendulum moves one way or the other. So we're moving into that time where we're bagging our own groceries, we're talking to less and less people. And for right now, it feels fun, it feels new and novel. But I wonder at a certain point, like you say, if we'll look back and say, oh, a human to human interaction, that's kind of cool, how quaint. Would that be a very small minority, like it feels nostalgic, or do you think we'll swing all the way back? Because I ask that because I've been in Japan, in Japan, it's yeah. like known for automation and bots and everything. And I quite enjoy the experience. Like I, I, I get exactly what I want. It's confirmed. I sit down and then magically a plate of food appears and, and no human hands have like touched it to make it dirty for me. Right. You know, I'm, I'm a germaphobe or whatever. And, and even here in certain sushi places, you put the order in via a touch screen and then it slides down a conveyor belt and it stops right at you and you take it out and it's gamified and, and it makes sounds and it's... It's kind of cool. It's like a Jetson age that we're living in. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that uh, eventually that's going to become a norm, right? Mm -hmm. And people will be even more comfortable with it. So mm -hmm. you're, you're like really tech savvy and kind of on top of things. So I would expect you to be into that today. But eventually everyone's going to kind of be used to that. And, and, and maybe you're right. Maybe we'll kind of start forgetting what it was like when we had human interaction. Or maybe we won't value that interaction at all. Uh, but I, I do think that feels weird to me. Mm. And that does seem like we're kind of sliding into that dystopian world where <laughs> where people don't talk to each other at all. I mean, have you been to a bar recently? It's like 90% of people are, are buried in their cell phone. Mm -hmm. and, and that feels really strange for me. Even as an introverted person, that feels, that feels weird to me. Mm. But I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I wouldn't be surprised if, if this does evolve so that, so that that is a pretty small segment right. who's for that personal connection. Me? Right. You mean it uh, turns into Wally? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. The, the world becomes Wally -E or uh, or Terminator 2, you know, whatever your movie of choice. Yeah. OK, so <laughs> like I, I, I unfortunately we have to bounce at 3.30, so I only have a few more minutes with you. Melissa, is there any hot burning question or can I start uh, moving into my, my final questions here? Uh, uh, well, what you were saying, you, uh, were, you were saying like the human connection is kind of lost and stuff. And I thought that was interesting that you were saying that because when I was writing my thesis, I discovered that people were using new ways to use technology to get closer to each other. Like they were, uh, you know, like mimes, um, meme, meme, memes, not mimes, <laughs> like memes. <laughs> they were like using memes to communicate something that they couldn't verbalize or they couldn't draw, you know, they, so they shared like an emotion through a meme. And um, I think that uh, what you were saying, it, that may be true. People may be more uh, may be more distant, right? But from what I see from studying marketing, I also see that there's more ways for us to connect with each other. Do you also see that kind of cultural cartography of applic of techno technology application? Yeah, I, th I think that's a brilliant and important point. And sometimes the paradox that we talk about is that the more connected we become, the more disconnected we are with one another. But technology is a great facilitator. So I don't know my next door neighbor on either side, but I know Chris Doe, right? I That's would right. not know Chris if we did not have the technology uh, enabling this connection. So mm -hmm. I know I probably know more people than I than I would because of what technology has provided. But 
what what are the what's the depth of that connection? And I think maybe that's where we're losing it. We're losing depth of connection with technology, not necessarily the um, the size of the network of mm-hmm. our of our connections. Mm-hmm. Okay, shoot, Zoom is like giving me some problems here. All right, so what we're gonna do is I want to ask you about this lecture that you have coming up. It's titled "Positive Psychology of Personal Branding." First of all, I love personal branding. So tease us a little bit. Tell us what you're gonna be talking about. Where and where and when are you doing this? Okay, so the talk is going to be July 7th in the afternoon in Indianapolis. This is at Mensa's annual gathering for 2018. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited to, uh, to talk to a bunch of Mensons who are, are probably going to rip me apart. But, but the reason I think this talk is cool is that personal branding has like kind of a bad reputation right now in that it's, it's people that are just trying to promote themselves, people that are, are being misleading about who they really are. And really, they're just trying to, to sell something through this kind of flashy, low substance personal brand that they've developed. So I'm going to put a different spin on it and talk about how developing your personal brand can really help you illuminate your life goals, how it can help you achieve greater happiness, greater work satisfaction. So really, I'm just trying to communicate all the positive psychology behind what what goes into building a, a personal brand. And so it doesn't become a chore for you either. It's something that, that can be really fulfilling and enjoyable. Perfect. And on that note, I want to let everybody know, this is my own plug. If you guys are in San Francisco, come and see me at the VMA Design Conference. It's happening this Friday, June 15th. I believe there are still some tickets available. You guys check it out, VMA Design Conference. Scott, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I want to let everybody also know where else they can find you. You have a YouTube channel. It's called Marketing Mixtape with Scott Davis, and it's at youtube.com slash Scott Davis PhD. Did I get that right? Yeah, I'm not that pretentious, but I have such a common name that I have to get creative <laughs> with my, my handles. No, Scott, for, for all the degrees he has and how smart he is, he's super down to earth and super chill. If you guys want to get in touch with Scott, uh, because he has a very common name. It's different on each social media. So here's his information, scottwdavis.com. That's how you can find the home base, if you will. And if you want to reach out to him via Twitter, it's Scott W. Davis. And he's got an Instagram account, but he's like, don't worry about that account. The most important one is go check out his YouTube channel. You interview and talk to lots of really smart and important people. So definitely a lot of value there, you guys. So go to Scott Davis PhD. Scott, thanks for coming on the show. I want to thank you thank and thank you. everybody that's tuning in at home checking this out thanks for making us a part of your day today for the second time in a row scott thank you very much let me give you some applause here Woo! <laughs> thank you and, it, and anyone who's going to vidcon my school's sending me to vidcon in anaheim in two weeks so if you're going to be there and you want to connect just uh give me a shout all right super tell us all about it let's take us out with isaac hayes come on chris do that